Sunday, what's, what's more important? Working for a living or the life that we work to live, Brother Rick? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of the first fruits, you know, is who gets the first, uh, the first helping. We don't want to give God leftovers, do we? No. So that's why we're here this morning. Stone Spring Elementary School, the Ecclesia Christ. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Brother Rick, would you take us to the Lord in prayer? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, this uh, first Sunday school, Lord, that we're gathering together before our sermon, Lord, and all those saints that have assembled with us. Lord, we're grateful that they came out in the cold and, and got themselves here, Lord, that uh, you know, they're so willing and open to hear your word. And, and Lord, we just ask that you be with us all here. Open our hearts, open our ears, Lord, and prepare our hearts to be pricked, Lord, that we might hear your word, know your word, understand what it is that that you have for us, what you hope for us. Lord, we just, we ask that you guide our teaching and our our speaking, Lord, that, that we're able to best convey what it is, your purpose that you want for us, Lord. And uh, make us, make what we share right and uh, give us the will and the strength to, to hold fast throughout the week from everything we study, putting into practice your word putting into uh, understanding everything we know into the hearts of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we've been doing this uh, ongoing study about uh, deception and avoiding the, dece the deceptions of the devil and our self-deceptions we found out last week and uh, also snares, things that the Bible says that the devil uses as a snare to trap us. And so I think, if I'm not mistaken, we're on point number five this morning, number brother. Five, right. Uh, controlling the tongue. Yep. All right, what do yep. you got, Rick? Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, Matthew 15. And, uh, let's see. And we'll go to, uh, let's see, verse 11. It's not what enters into the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. That, uh, you know, what, what it is that, uh, you go down to verse 18 in chapter 15, it says, but things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. So that's what they mean by it's not what goes into the mouth that comes out of the mouth, because what comes out of the mouth has come from the heart, and that's from the spirit that's within the person, and that's that's what we're being judged on, uh, and that's what we need to know that you know we can say and act and you know walk a certain way and give the appearance to things, but it's what's truly coming up out of our heart that you know we're truly going to be judged on, you know, not just what we show other people, you know. It's like how many people, you know, warm a seat on Sunday, but the rest of the week they're living for themselves. And, you know, I said, if you're not living for Christ, you're living for the devil. So, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, that, you know, what it is that we're doing, you know, where, where it comes from. And, uh, you know, in verse, uh, in James 1, verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Deceives his own heart. So, so we know this verse is in the Bible. We know that controlling the tongue from James, we've heard that many mm -hmm. times. How can... How can knowing that, is it possible we could know that and still not control our tongue? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's easy enough to do if we're, if we're not filled with, uh, you know, compassion for others, if we're not filled with patience for others, if we've not, you know, put into practice the word enough and really done the hard work, the heavy lifting of making it part of us so that we can endure whatever gets thrown at us and might make us upset that we remember, you know, that 
we are to be as Christ and that we are to you know, endure all things and not stumble. Right. Well, we go, let's go back up to verse 19. That's the answer right there. All right. All right. Read James 1.19. So that's James 1, 19. to hear, yeah. For the anger of, of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Right, because we know, you know, we have to try to remember, and I know it, it's hard sometimes, uh, you know, that each one of us was made by God, put on earth by God, you know, we are a creation of God, and uh, you know, each one of us deserves to be shown a, a different way. And when we, you know, we, we react to anger towards someone, you know, we're, we're forgetting what we're, why we're here. You know, that we are here, you and I were talking earlier, we are here to bring others to salvation. You know, what is the legacy we leave behind? Is it, you know... Uh, a monument to ourselves in our home, in our business, in our bank account, or is it, you know, uh, a legacy of Christians that go forth and make other Christians? You know, what's what's the what's God going to value? You know, you got your big home, but God can use the whole earth as a footstool. You know, so what's going to impress Him? Not that the cathedral, you know, Notre, the cathedral of Notre Dame, is, that's just a speck of dust on His footstool. I don't but, like that gothic architecture anyway. They got those flying buttresses. I mean, you got to almost have a triangle to hold it up, and that <laughs> stained glass, and mm -hmm. you know those uh, big vaults. And uh, you know, we went into a cathedral like that over in Russia. And my wife just found this old video, and Natalie was just like, you know, three or four years old, and we weren't even supposed to take a video camera in there. But I got a video, and Natalie looked up. And they were doing an archaeological dig, and they had they were digging up all the bones of the saints that were buried in that place. And Natalie looked up and said, "Dad, there's dead people buried in here." <laughs> and uh, my wife said something like, "Yeah, and uh, that doesn't include the living. <laughs> Some people are living and still dead. You know, you got the dead people buried, and you know, I wonder, I wonder how much you know the Lord looks down." We can have our body in the pew. We can, you know, we can be existing and not be living. You know, we, we don't know how God looks at things, do we? Uh, we can't judge. We judge according to the eye, but the Lord looks at our heart. And it, I think the Bible says something to the effect that the Lord knows those who are his. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're here this morning to try to make sure that, that those is as many people as possible. And, you know, everything we do is for edification, to try to build up. It should be for that. Should be for yeah. Should be. To try to bring out the best. And, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, if we're going to tell the truth, you know, this week we just had some conversations where we really had to hold accountable. And it's a ministry that it's not comfortable doing, but it's the best to hold people accountable and go to them, you know, go to that person. And, uh, but, you know, if, if you have the right uh, motivation, you know, mm -hmm. it really helps. And you have the right spirit. And even difficult things that are difficult to the world can be accomplished to God's glory. The Lord can get glory out of it. But, you know, we've got to control our tongues. And, mm -hmm. you know, it goes for me and like, so like, you know, everybody else. Like I say, you know, like, sometimes it comes to the point, and, and the Bible's clear, 
how do we go about people that are, are maybe backsliding or people that have wronged you, you know, whether they be worldly or whether they be you know, your brothers and sisters. You know, there's, there's a way to it. And, and not only is it, you know, how, how it's suggested here in the, in the Bible, but it's expected, you know, because all those things that bother us, that upset us, that, uh, you know, make us feel like we're hurt by someone, this all becomes seeds of unrighteousness that get planted in our heart. The roots of bitterness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so we need to make sure that we don't let this stuff linger. Because literally, you know, what starts out as a little weed could end up as big as a redwood or a sequoia, you know, growing in your heart. And, and, and that's, and then what good are you to, to, to God's church? You know, if, you, if you've allowed yourself to become a cancer in the body, when all you had to do was get a, you know, they say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, and all you needed to do was go to this person and get it cleared up. Because how much of it is just a simple misunderstanding of interpretation of words? You know, bridle the tongue, you know, control the tongue, know what you're saying. And also, you're also responsible to know how it's being heard, to make sure it's clear. Not only do they have to hear it and hear it, try to understand how you mean it, you have to make sure that, that they're hearing it the way you mean it. And like I said, John, going to your brother and say, we need, you know, the, the ministry of, you know, cleaning up hurts, cleaning up wrongs. You know, it, it's, there's a skill to it, you know, to do it right, to do it Christianly, you know, and, and it's all about how we approach, how we speak, how it comes from the heart. And, uh, you know, without knowing how to control our tongue, having that, the endurance of patience and compassion, uh, you know, we could drive people out. Mm -hmm. Let's go to that root of bitterness. You, you, uh, there was a Bible way of saying what you were saying, Rick. Yeah, you called it a it. seed, and, and the seeds in the Bible, there's good mm -hmm. seeds and bad seeds. Mm -hmm. What did you call it? A seed of... Uh, seeds of, uh, of unrighteousness. Seeds of unrighteousness. And, you know, things can take root, and bad things can take root in our lives. And we've got to cultivate. Our spiritual life is like a garden. You know, God made the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had to cultivate it. That Garden of Eden is our spiritual life. And we have to weed uh, with, you know, our hoe. And weed the weeds out. Let's turn to Hebrews 12, 15. But as we're turning, let's open it up. Is there anybody that has some wisdom or share wants to share with us on things they do to fall into the trap of, of the unbridled tongue? I think sometimes we, we just use, well, it's the truth. And that's true. It's yeah, the it's the truth. And some things don't need, and some truthful things don't need to be acknowledged, because uh, there's a proverb that says a wise man conceals a matter. Uh, so there's a time to conceal something, and usually, uh, for me, it's it's if uh, you know some of our church members are working on their spiritual life, you know they're they're working on it, and you don't look at it as a snapshot in time. It's a process of development, and they're trying to overcome things in their life. The worst thing in the world would be to gossip about them or to put them down or or to de even worse than that is not to say anything to despise them in our heart to have contempt because uh, that's you know we don't even say anything but it's we got to control our own way of thinking to look down on somebody who's lesser than you know we are in the sense that uh you know they they're they're brand new christians or they're weak or uh young in their christian life and trying to uh, develop that walk with Christ. Why would we look down on someone? That's right. That's right. All right. Who's got, uh, why don't we read, uh, I'll read it, Hebrews 12, 15, and let's back up to verse 14. We're talking about ways to avoid falling into the traps and the temptations and uh, deceiving ourselves. We're talking about our tongue, how it gets us in trouble, and we can deceive our own heart. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 14, it says, pursue peace with all people. 
Now, that's a good strategy, isn't it? Try to sue for peace. And how can we do that in our conversation? Pursue peace with all people. What if we have differences of opinions? Well, I think of a classic example in Romans 14. There, there was a church at Rome that had Jews and Gentiles, and they had different opinions about what they should eat. And you know what Paul said? Uh, if you eat meat or don't eat meat, you know what he told them? Keep it to yourself. Right. Keep it to yourself. He didn't say, I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. He just said, keep it to yourself. That's a great strategy to follow, right? There's a time to keep things to ourselves, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. And uh, pursue peace with all people. My dad hated when we were little kids and we'd ride in the car and say, la, 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 la. You know, <laughs> assertion A, no, you're not. No, yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. He hated contradicting people. You're not allowed. We were not allowed to contradict people. Well, Dad, what if they're wrong? Well, you know, you, you weren't, weren't allowed to contradict. We could appeal to a higher authority, but we're not allowed to contradict because it's the lowest form of, uh, of intelligence. It's not even intelligence. It's, and uh, how many times today I find people in that same trap that we were when we were little kids, you know, just contradicting people. That's not pursuing peace, is it? I like, I met a wise old guy and we would tell him things and he would talk. He would never contradict us or he would say, well, I would say, you know, and, that's, and that, was a, that was a good way to do it, wasn't it? I, I realized mm -hmm. later on what he was saying. He, you know, he, maybe he didn't agree, agree with everything, but he was trying to find the common ground. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, isn't that what Paul did? He tries to find the common ground. He tried to be all things to all people. And that doesn't mean you have to be a liar or a phony, but just try to find a bridge with people. I know in the Church of Christ there are certain things we believe that, you know, makes us exclusive. It's so funny because people tell me, well, this group over here, this group over here, they believe the same thing you did. And I'm thinking to myself, if they believe the same thing that we did, we'd be one. Amen. Wouldn't right. we know about them? Amen. I know who my sister congregations are in town. Mm -hmm. All right? I know who they are. You think there's some secret sister congregation in the valley that we don't know about? We would have run into them by now, but okay, all right. But I try to build a bridge. Instead of focusing on what we disagree on, what can we ag agree on? Yeah. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right? The atonement, the cross, the blood. I passed a guy up on 81 the other day. He had a license plate, John 858. And, and then I found out it, he's, he's one of my good friends. I didn't know he drove his big SUV with a license plate, John 858. And I, was, it, I knew it was somewhere around uh, between the, uh, you know, the conversation at the woman in the well and then the uh, Jesus taking on his uh, critics, the Pharisees. But it's the, when he was, they were, the Pharisees were challenging him on who he was. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. That's what John 8, 58 says. That's a great, powerful point this morning. And Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. But trying to find the common ground. You know, I could, I could unite on John 8, 58 and build a great bridge with a guy. All right. Hebrews 12, we're talking about the tongue. In Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So we, it starts with a little acorn seed, doesn't it? Maybe a bird's traveling over at 35,000 feet. Drops that thing right in your backyard, right next to your electrical box. And the next thing you know, you got a big hickory tree putting roots in your mm -hmm. utility line, your <laughs> service box. And uh, that's going to be a problem, isn't it, if you let that thing grow up? What could be worse than having your electrical service, you know, overturned, but to have our spiritual power box Entangled by the root of bitterness, leading to sin, falling away from the grace of God. We gotta, we gotta be on the alert. What do he say? Look, look carefully. 
look careful. Reminds me of my grandma every time we, you know, pull out of the driveway. Be careful, be careful. <laughs> you know, how many, we need the preachers be, saying, be careful, be careful, right? Talking about our, our spiritual relationships. All right, Rick, what do you got here, brother? We got Matthew 15, James 1, uh, 26, James 1, 19, Hebrews 12, 15. What's okay. next on I, our agenda? I, James 3, 2. All right. Even the heading itself says it all. I don't have a heading. What does your heading say? It says, the tongue is a fire. All right. I know what fire it is, too. It's Gehenna. Mm -hmm. It's the burning garbage dump, which is a picture of the everlasting lake of fire. These Jehovah Witnesses, they make me so mad. Oh, hell's not really hell. Jesus is looking, is directing our attention to the burning garbage dump in the valley of Hinnom called Gehenna. And it's filled with garbage and vile things and it's on fire because that's the way you kept your sanitation for your landfill. Or you take the trash. Take the trash and they're burning it. And Jesus is talking about, you know, it's better to go in life in a such and such state maimed than to go out into eternity in the hell, the Gehenna fire. So obviously whatever that burning garbage dump is a picture of what the lake of fire is going to be. Hell is not hell. <laughs> it's a metaphor. All right, what does he say? All what right. does our tongue do? All right. Uh, Twelve verses here. All right. Through. Okay, starting in verse two. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into a, the horse's mouth, so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Behold, the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are di still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, for every world of iniquity, of iniquity the tongue is set among our members, as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. Our what? Course of our life. Okay. And is, and is set on fire by hell. What kind of hell? Do you have a footnote? Gehenna. Gehenna. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and curses. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? No. Neither can salt water produce fresh. That's a good creation evolution verse, by the way, isn't it? Yeah. Because the evolutionists would have to, they'd have to think about that. A couple, you know, a couple hundred million years, maybe a fig could turn into a, a, an olive, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's not what he's talking about. Uh, you know, Rick, what about that verse in verse 9, James 3, 9? How can we bless and curse with the same heart and organ? We can't do that, can we? Simultaneously bless and curse? Almost a double-minded yeah. man. It? Sure is a double-minded man. Like say what I was waiting. Right. Uh, what about we curse men? And here's a great thing to remember. What is the sin about cursing men? Maybe they're not Christian men. Maybe they're neighbors. Maybe they're you know, uh, Zacchaeus up in the in the sycamore tree, that little guy that's IRS agent, you know, that's <laughs> ripped us off, right? Uh-huh. And, uh... Well, Paul writes in that Corinthian letter that some of which we were. Yeah. Yeah, but this guy, Zacchaeus, is, is really bad. He, he's like an IRS agent, Randy. I mean, we can forgive <laughs> the other sinners. <laughs> and he said, Lord, if I've stolen anything, which he did... You know, I wonder how Zacchaeus could afford to pay all those guys back four times. But uh, 
Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, yeah. How can we look down on a sinner when we when when really we were and still are? Because Paul said, uh, you know, Christ came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He didn't say I was chief. Right. He said I am chief. And what's why would it be such a, a, a God hold it uh, so accountable for cursing somebody? But look at what verse 9 says, because they're made in the image of God. Now, do you know how many warnings we have? That's at least the second warning I have about treating somebody, another man, badly in the image of God. Remember the first time we have some kind of injunction because, because somebody was made in the image of God? Pardon? Well, what about what about murder? Because eventually we're going to get to that, aren't we, Rick? Mm -hmm. With our tongue, we, we're murderers, aren't we? Yes. Do you know we go back to the to the first uh, murder, capital punishment, uh, in Genesis eight? These these people today, Rick, I, I don't think they have any morality. I think they just whatever the Bible says, they take the opposite point of view. <laughs> You know these bumper stickers? I, I got some photos of new bumper stickers over the weekend. Going to blow your mind. I saw one that said, gonna, what would God, Gandhi do? What would what? What would Gandhi what do? Would Gandhi do? I have one. Yeah. I have one, what would Buddha do? Really? Yeah, Buddha and Gandhi. And uh, we're still going to visit your Indian friend. Yeah. I was going to preach on it, but some other people were coming and wanted me to preach something else. But, Isn't you know. Buddha yeah. Yeah, what would Buddha do? Rot. In Genesis 9, do you know why? Do you know why God wants the capital punishment put into effect? And and somebody said, well, that's Old Testament. No, it's not. When does the Old Covenant start? When does the Old Testament start, David? When does the Old Testament start? Yeah. Genesis. Right. Genesis what? Well, if you go by the Testament, you go by Moses. You go by Moses, okay? Now, if you want the covenant, some of the typological covenants, you go to Abraham. But whatever covenant God made with Noah was not revoked. This covenant is still in effect. There's a rainbow in the sky, right? Do we still have rainbows occasionally? Mm -hmm. Are you still eating meat at the restaurant after the service? Right? Why are you, why are you allowed to eat meat? Do we have four seasons? Rick, do we have four seasons? Yep. You know, before the flood... If I had a nickel for every person complaining about the cold weather, how much <laughs> money would you have, Rick? It would be a lot. I mean, why doesn't everybody just move to Florida? Why don't we just have one, one big nation, you know, Florida, and everybody move there? And everything else can be a hunting reserve. Hmm. Except for the Californians and the New Yorkers. But don't give anybody <laughs> ideas. We have four seasons, right? And what did God say? Well, there's certain rules that he put in. In Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains. Now, what does that mean? As long as the earth is in effect, we're going to have what? We're going to have spring and fall. Now, it doesn't say spring and fall. What is that? Seed time. Identi harvest. Identical with. Yeah, planting and harvest. Planting and harvest. Cold and heat. Too hot. Too cold. Winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. All right. So we're going to worry about global warming? Yeah, it's rather pointless. <laughs> How about in the 70s, in, in, when we had two blizzards in 78? The Ohio super bomb, the Ohio blizzard of 78? Up and when a big polar vortex collided with a massive uh, precipitation uh, over Lake Erie, and we had the bombogenesis effect go into a, f it was the lowest atmospheric pressure ever recorded in U.S. history. The millibars, uh, a bombogenesis is when the barometer drops 24 millibars in 24 hours. It dropped 28 millibars. We already had 16 inches of snow on the ground. Put another 44 inches down in that storm. Two days, January 27 to 29, 1978, which is how many years ago? 35 years ago. 
And then we get a week later, Jan uh, February 5th, we get a big massive uh, eastern, northeaster uh, storm that was centered in Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. And they thought that we were entering global cooling and they thought we were going to have an ice age. Everybody was really worried. I'm telling you, when we were young, when I was young, the scientists, the people, the conventional people in, who controlled the mass media said we were entering an ice age. I remember that. We were going to freeze to death. I remember that. All right, time's short. Yeah, the sun was burning out of fuel. And if you didn't pay your light bill, it didn't matter because the lights were going to go out. And, but anyway, all these laws are still in effect. And what did God say? He said in, in Genesis 9, 5, Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. You know, a dog bites you. God said it's to be put to death. Nowadays, if somebody's dog bites you, they're like, oh, poor dog. Oh, get out of here. It's your fault my dog bit you. Right. You know, and uh, you go get your rabies shots because you'll poison my dog. That's the way people are. They love their dog more than they love their neighbor. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. So don't, capital punishment is not murder. There's murder and then there's warfare. It's a different word in Hebrew. Capital punishment. People say, oh, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. What if you do, if you, you kill, you're put to death. It says thou shalt do no murder. And if a person murders, why is God so upset about it? He says in, in Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Why? For in the image of God he made man. That's why we're not allowed to murder somebody, because any every person of the human race was made in the image of God. By the same token, in James, we're not allowed to talk about somebody and use our tongue to slander a man, which is to murder with our tongue, our words, because that man is made in the image of God. We're not allowed to curse him, not allowed to murder, not allowed to curse. And that's why Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said don't murder. He says, but if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already murdered him. I can't think of a stronger motivation, a stronger warning to control my tongue than, mm -hmm. than, to, than to see it's serious business, isn't it? Yeah, the because yeah, because if down that same road too. what's that gossiping, gossiping. Mm -hmm. all I've heard that, that comes this from guy, the heart. You know, this and that, you know, just start talking. That's just, you're almost stabbing that person in the back, stabbing him in the back. You don't know, you don't, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's like Tom was, he was talking about a barometer. Your mouth can be your barometer, you hear what you're saying. You should open your eyes if it doesn't sound like something you know that you've. Heard Christ tell you to do or not tell you not to do. You know you've got. Uh, you know you have to watch your mouth because that's, you know, or pay attention. You know because that, like I said, that can be a warning sign that, you know, what what is coming from you, what comes from a man, you know, defiles him. And if you realize that the words you're saying, if you heard it from somebody else, you judge them and say that you know their heart is defiled. Well, this that's coming from your your mouth. You know, you should have your eyes wide open at that point, you know, because it's, you know, that's what's coming from the heart. And at the same time, you know, we've studied before about the eyes. The eyes are the, they say, let's say it's the window of the soul, but it's, it's, it's a little different than that. They're the, they're the lamp of the body, and that doesn't mean they shine out. It means what you're looking at illuminates the body. Where your eyes are pointed, what you're looking at, what you're letting come in your mind is going to, Affects who you are inside your heart, the light. You know, it's not. Is it the white light, you know, of Christ, or are you getting a black light, a red light? You know, something that's coloring your heart and your mind and your your vision, your memories. You know, to be something that is not Christ. You know, and then what you say, how you act, that tells you. You know, it's just your warning sign that you need to look at what you've been doing and what's become part of your heart and now what's coming out from you. And you should realize you need to, you know, there's things that you need to clean up with people and things that you need to, you know, get your rudder, get you back on the, on the right course. 
your feet have started to wander side to side, you're widening your path and you need to narrow your path down a little bit. It's, uh, you know, you don't want something bad to come out of your mouth, but when it does, it's time for you to do a double check. Well, we, need to, we need to be ther thermostats and not thermometers. You know, a thermometer just tells what the outside is doing. We need to set the temperature for Jesus Christ. We're going to come back and uh, talk. I don't know if we have some more tongue scriptures, but we're going to come back and uh, finish yeah, I think up. We can, we can sit on this for another day. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back. We're going to, you got our outline. If you need an outline, let us know. And uh, But let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for some scriptures, God, that we've hit, the James, the Matthew, Lord, uh, scriptures about the Hebrews, 12, 15, God, about the root of bitterness. Lord, just help us to control our tongues. Help us not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. We're all made in your image. We're redeemed by the blood of your son. And Lord, we're, we're just, uh, just unworthy servants, Lord, trying to do the duty. And God, whatever we live by and have is by your grace. Father, thank you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.